Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians 8. The next two chapters are on giving, financial giving for Christians. And this is really getting down to where people live. D.L. Moody once said that a man is not saved until his wallet is saved. Jesus said it like this, where a man's treasure is, there his heart will be also. And so you can really see where a person's heart is by where they spend their money. And so a person whose heart is focused on the kingdom of God is going to be channeling his resources toward the kingdom of God. And a person who is whose heart is set on the things of the world are going to channel their resources in that direction. little background now. Paul wanted to take an offering to the mother church in Jerusalem. So Christianity started in Jerusalem the day of Pentecost and then spread out from there to Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth, to Gentile areas. And so Paul being the apostle to the Gentiles, when he went to Gentile churches, his desire was to take a, an offering from them to take back to the Jerusalem church because the Jerusalem church, after a time, became very poor. The reason was they were persecuted for their faith. There was also a, a severe famine in the land of Israel at that time. So these brothers in the Jerusalem church were poor, whereas the Gentile churches that Paul had gone to plant, they were often well-to-do. Specifically, the church in Corinth was very well off. The Macedonian church, as we'll see, uh, they were not so well off, and yet they gave abundantly. And so Paul, wanting to take this offering back to the Jerusalem church, which would kind of show how that middle wall of separation between Jew and Gentile is broken down in Christ, There used to be such an animosity between Jew and Gentile, but in Christ, we're united in one. Neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, we're all one in Christ Jesus. And this is something that that offering would really show as they would take it back to Jerusalem. And so Paul had already shared this plan with the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, when we studied through that, Paul gave the details of it. I'm going to read it to you. He says, Now concerning the collection for the saints. This is that collection for the Jewish Christians in in Jerusalem. He says, As I've given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you also must do. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay aside something, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters... I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. So he'd already told them about this plan, this scheme, this fundraising. And they jumped at the idea. And they had said, we're going to give a massive gift. We're going to give big time, is what they responded. Is how they responded. And so Paul now, says, okay, you said that you're going to respond, now do it. This had been a year since the first appeal came out, and they hadn't done anything about it. And you know how it is when you say, I'm going to do something, but then you procrastinate and you don't do it. It gets harder and harder and harder to actually carry it out. So Paul says, okay, you've said it verbally, you've committed to doing it, now do it. Carry through with it. This is what he's going to get into here. Now this was a specific situation at a specific time in the life of this church. But what Paul lays down here are principles for giving that apply to all time. And in fact, these two chapters are some of the best instructions on giving in the entire Bible. So let's start reading here. Chapter 8, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, 
We make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. When Paul wrote this, he was in Macedonia. You remember that he had left Ephesus. He went up north to Troas, didn't find Titus there, went over to Macedonia, and there he met Titus. And so he's seeing how these churches in Macedonia responded to this call to give, and he's saying, wow, they, though they're poor, they gave abundantly. And I don't know if you've seen this, but in my Christian life, I have seen this to be true, that quite often, poor people give more than those who have wealth. It's quite often the case. I remember when we did ministry down in Juarez, Mexico, these people had hardly anything. They were living, a lot of them were living in, in um, um, shipping crates. And, you know, with tar paper over the top of it, they had hardly anything. And yet, they were providing out of their, really, their necessity Everything that they had, they would provide for their brothers and sisters in Christ. When we went to do ministry in Hungary, a lot of these people had very little. But when we went as a mission team to some of the houses there, they would spend sometimes days or weeks worth of wages to put on a meal for a mission team. And here we are, kind of rich Americans going in to minister. And we felt guilty for it. But to deny the meal was an offense to them. And so they wanted to just give and give and give. And quite often that's the case. That poor people give more than rich people. And the reason I believe is because they understand the pain, the suffering, the hardship that people go through when they're poor. They can relate. And so they give. They give. And that's what happened here. Um, I was reading about Richard Wormbrand, who many of you no, he was uh, a Romanian pastor during the time uh, that the communists came in, and he was in prison for his faith and tortured. Um, wrote a book called Tortured for Christ. And some of the stories that came out of prison in his life were that, you know, he would get uh, some dirty soup and a, a piece of bread on a daily basis. And so what he would do, because he was a, a tither, is he would tithe that dirty soup and that bread. He would take a portion of it every week or every few weeks and he would give that away to some brother who was there or some person who was being persecuted as well so that they could have something. I was reading about um, the Jews in the concentration camps and how they, having nothing and living on starvation diets, if they began to hoard food to themselves... The other ones around them knew that they were almost done for. But if they were to give of what they received and they provided for other people who were poor and, and less off than they were, they had a chance of survival. Very interesting. It's quite often the poor who give the most. But notice what he says here. He says that in a great trial of affliction and the abundance of their joy... So when they were afflicted, guess what? They had joy. They had the joy of the Holy Spirit. And their deep poverty abounded to the riches of their liberality. And back in verse 1 he says, We make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. The grace of God. Now, when we think of the grace of God, we think of God's free gift. That God just willingly... He gives love. He gives unmerited favor. He gives us His help. But here, the grace of God inspired them to give. Inspired them to dig down out of their poverty and just give whatever they had. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability... They were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. I find this interesting phrase. 
He says, according to their ability, and yes, beyond their ability, they were freely willing. They wanted to give even more than they had. So you can imagine what was taking place. They said, okay, Paul, as a church, we've got 10,000 pounds, let's say. But oh, we wish we had 15,000 pounds to give. And isn't that what grace does? Grace doesn't say, well, how much can I keep to myself? The grace says, how much can I give to others? And that was their heart. They wanted to give even more than they had. And I bet Paul probably said, oh, 10,000 pounds, oh, that's, that's everything you've got to live on. No, no, you, you keep it for yourself. But they implored him. We want to be part of this giving program. Please let us, let us give. And they kept urging him to take it. Do you remember when Jesus one time went up to the temple with his disciples and it says that he was watching how the people put their money into the treasury. And he saw that the rich put in very much and some did it ostentatiously, I'm sure, and blew a trumpet, you know, and big fanfare, look what I'm giving. But then he saw this widow and she came in. Nobody else saw her. She's probably just in rags, just dragging a foot. And she throws in two little copper coins, two mites. And Jesus went, oh, guys, did you see that? That widow put in more than all the others. Because she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. But they, out of their abundance just gave the extra. So they might have given a lot more as a, a monetary gift, but the way God measured it, He said, no, she gave a lot more than they gave because she gave out of her poverty everything that she had to live on. The way God measures giving is not the amount, but the sacrifice that it takes to give that gift. So you get a person who makes a million pounds a year. He might give a hundred thousand pounds to the church. And you think, wow, that's, that's quite a lot. If my math is right, that's about 10%. Hmm. But you take somebody that makes a hundred thousand pounds and they give 20,000 pounds to the church. Even though the monetary gift is less, as a percentage, as a sacrifice, it's a whole lot more. And the way, that's the way God sees it. And so these Macedonian Christians, they wanted to give even more than they had. And not only as we had hoped, verse 5, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So not only did they give money, but it says they first gave themselves to God. I think this is really important because if you give money without first giving yourself to God, it's really meaningless. In fact, a lot of people try to do that. People have a guilty conscience. And so maybe once a year they'll go to church and they'll throw an offering into the tithe box. And it kind of soothes the guilty conscience. Look what I did for God. But they haven't given themselves to God first. And what God is really after is our hearts, our lives. He wants us first. Not, just, not our money. Our God has all the money in the world. It's all His anyway. But He doesn't want our hearts to be taken by the things of this world. So giving is good for us. It's not, it's not for God. God doesn't need really our money. But giving is good for us. And so first, they gave themselves to God. You remember what it says in Romans 12.1? I beseech you, I urge you therefore, brothers, to offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. So we say, God, here I am. Here's my whole life. Body, soul, and spirit, it's all yours. We give ourselves to God. And then he says, not only did they give themselves to the Lord, but then to us by the will of God. So he's speaking about this fundraising appeal that Paul was going to take to Jerusalem. And they said, okay, now that we've given ourselves to God, we want to give ourselves to this fundraising appeal. 
We see that God is in this and we want to get behind it. They knew it was God's will. And so we urge Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. So when Titus had gone to visit this church, you remember that Titus was like a mailman. He took Paul's letters around and he had taken one of his letters to the church. When he was there, he brought up this issue of the offering for the mother church in Jerusalem. And he encouraged them to do it. You guys have said you're going to do it. Now go ahead and do it. Now Paul urges him to go back and be sure that they completed what they started. And again, often, isn't it true that our good intentions come to nothing because we don't complete a task? And this is a mark of immaturity. Immaturity is when we say we're going to do something, but we don't follow through and do it. Whereas when we mature, as a mature Christian, we say we're going to do something and we keep our word. Whether it's hurtful to us or not, we're going to keep it. We're going to finish what we start. Jesus told a story about a a landowner who had two sons. He talked to the older son and he said, Son, I want you to go into my vineyard and work there today. And he said, I will. But then he didn't go. And he said to the other son, I want you to go work in my vineyard today. And at first the son said, No, I won't. But then he went and did it. And so then Jesus asked the leaders of the, of the Jews who were there, he said, Which one of them did the will of the Father? He said, the one that did what he said to do. So it's not what you say out of your mouth, but it's how you carry it through that counts. And that's the mark of maturity. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. Well, you can see here that this church had a lot going for it. They had faith. They were trusting in the Lord. They they were faithful to one another in the church. In speech, you remember that they had the gift of tongues. They had prophecy and word of wisdom, word of knowledge. They had all of these things in their church, as we read through in uh, in 1 Corinthians. In knowledge... They understood spiritual mysteries, hidden things. Do you remember what Jesus or what Paul said about that, 1 Corinthians 13? Though I understand all mysteries and have all knowledge, but have not love, profits me nothing. Uh, They had all diligence. So you remember when Paul wrote that severe letter to them and told them to get their act right? They did. They got right with God. They got serious about their walk. They had all diligence at that point. But then he says this, and in your love for us. Now, as we've been going through this letter, you can see that, you know, he was saying, open up your heart to me. Open up your heart to us. We love you, but your your heart is closed to our love. Please open up. And yet here he says, You've got this in your favor, that you have love for us. And I believe that Paul, being so gracious, after he sent that severe letter, they responded by saying, you know what, Paul was right. We need to open up our heart. We need to receive him. We want to see him. And so he says, look, you you do have love for us. So, By the way, some manuscripts, and maybe in your Bible, it says, in the love we inspired for you. So it's not, it's not that, um, that they had a love that came straight from themselves, but it was a love that Paul had given them that they responded to. I speak not by commandment, but I'm testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. Paul's not commanding them to give, but he's saying, look, by the grace that God has given you, I want you to to give this gift. 
True love cannot be forced love. True grace cannot be forced grace. It's freely given. But notice he says this, But I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. Now, this to me is a very heavy statement. He's saying to the Corinthian church, he's saying, I am testing what you say and how sincere you are in your love by how sincere the the Macedonian churches are. That's heavy. And I had to ask myself this week as I was studying that, as I compare my own life with others who display love, and this church with other churches that display love, I had to ask, how are we doing, Lord? Now, that's a heavy thing to, to think about. John the Apostle in 1 John 3.16 put it like this. By this we know love, because He laid down His life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. He's saying this, that we're not to love just with words, but in deed and in truth. And he says, here's a very practical way that you display your love. If you see a brother in need and you do not help that brother, then your words are meaningless. Your love is only skin deep. He's saying, you've got to do something. If you have the power to do it, you've got to help that brother. I find these to be very challenging in my own life. He is testing the sincerity of their love by the diligence of the Macedonian church. He says, look, since the Macedonian church is a great example of practical love, generosity, I'm going to line you up side by side with them to see how sincere your love is, how sincere your desire to help really is. The Macedonians promised, and they did it, The Corinthians promised, but they haven't done it yet. And so as I've looked at this, and I've been thinking about other churches, and I think, you know, there are a lot of churches that I know that really do give to the poor, that really do help their members quite a lot. And I see that in us too. I see how we're reaching out to poor people, and we're helping, and we're caring for one another. But I think, you know what? We could go more and more, couldn't we? We could really get to know each other more and find out the struggles and difficulties that we're facing and really come alongside one another and help one another. And how would the church look, you know, if we did that more and more and more and we were giving of ourselves in this way? Now, I want to say something about giving to the poor because specifically here, He's talking about giving to poor Christians, isn't he? He's talking about these poor people in Jerusalem who are Christians. Now certainly as you read through the Bible, God wants us to care for poor people in general, whether they're Christian or not. But the highest priority has got to be with our own church family. You know, if we had a food program that could... You know, feed all the homeless people in in Hastings. Wouldn't that be amazing? But we don't. Um, But God wants us to take care of the people that are part of the church, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, there is a thing that we'll label the social gospel. Let me explain what that is. The social gospel is where churches just simply think that feeding homeless people and clothing people who don't have clothes and and giving money to poor people is what the gospel is. It's, It's what Christians are only supposed to do. 
Because they see Jesus reaching out to sick people and healing them and all that. But actually, that is a fruit of the real gospel. See, the real gospel is simply this. That man, women, children, we've all sinned against God. We're separated from God by our sins. But Christ has come and has died for us. And if we receive Christ, we're brought into a right relationship with God. Whether we've got a lot of money or a little money. And because of that right relationship that we have with God, then we reach out to people in love and help them socially, help them in uh, feeding, clothing, shelter, giving money, that kind of thing. The real gospel should always lead to real action. It should always be that way. And historically, you see the church doing that You see people like William Wilberforce because of his Christian convictions. You know, um, in Parliament, really lobbying for the end of the slave trade. You see Lord Shaftesbury who fought for child labor laws for years and years because of his Christian convictions. He did these things as a result of the gospel. But that wasn't the gospel itself. It was a fruit of it. He also was the one that formed the YMCA. Turn over with me for a moment to James chapter 2. I want you to look at this. James chapter 2 verse 14. He says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. He's talking here about somebody that has a said faith. Oh, you know... I became a Christian when I was eight years old. And so I'm saved. I, you know, I prayed when I was a, a little boy. But their life doesn't match up with the profession of their faith. They live in sin. What comes out of their mouth is profanity. They don't go to church. They don't read their Bible. They're living just like every other unbeliever. And yet they say they're Christians. He says, if you have a said faith... But you don't have a life that backs it up. Your said faith is worthless. Faith without works is dead, is what he's saying. Now, are we saved by faith alone? Yes. But the faith that saves is not alone. It comes with good works. We're not saved by our good works, but we're saved unto good works. So, going back to this Social gospel versus the real gospel. When we think about feeding people and we think about helping poor people, this is something we should do. But it in of itself is not the gospel. It is a fruit of the gospel. And so faith comes with good works. So I know that many of you, you have a passion, you have a desire to give. It's in your heart because you're born again. And you want to know, where can I give my resources? I want to give um, as much as I possibly can. Well, here's the pattern. First, you give to your local church. And I'm not saying that to line my pockets. I mean, it's kind of an odd thing for a pastor to say, but it's true. I'm not saying that. But God's taking care of all my needs. So, I'm saying this so that fruit abounds to your account. So when you give to your local church, God, you're storing up treasure in heaven. And God's going to take care of that when you go to see Him. So first give to your local church, and then above and beyond that, you give to Christian charities, Christian missions, Christian causes. And here in town, we're plenty of them. You've got Hope Kitchen. You've got Snowflake, where they take care of homeless people at night. These are great ministries that we can be involved with financially. 
And as a church, we do give to these things, but you can give individually. We're going to be doing a fundraiser for CDC uh, on March 1st. That's a ministry in Thailand that helps out handicapped children um, because the Buddhist government just doesn't want to take care of them, but, but the Christians come in and they, they help them out. So we're going to be doing a, a Thai meal fundraiser on March 1st, which should be great. Where is that right? March 1st? Are we on for that? Good. Don't miss it. Um, Oh, sorry, CCD. I printed that wrong. CCD. And what does it actually stand for? Uh, (laughs) (laughs) On our Christian Care Foundation for Children with Disabilities. Great. (laughs) Christian Care Foundation. Okay. So, we also support Mission for Vision. That is a a ministry to um, people in Africa where they... They give them eyesight and then, well, glasses for their eyes, and then they preach the gospel to them. So it's a kind of a way in um, by meeting their physical needs where they can meet their spiritual needs. We support Samaritan's Purse with the shoebox giving. Compassion International for children in uh, third world countries. You can adopt a child. Open doors for the persecuted church. Great way to serve the Lord in that way. And also, Chosen People Ministries in North London, we support them. Um, and we have, very, from the very beginning, because we've taken Genesis 12, 3 to heart, um, God said to Abraham, those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. Speaking of the Jews. So we commit a portion of the offerings to this church to Chosen People Ministries. They're reaching out to Jewish people in North London. So these are all areas that we give as a church and where you can get involved with with your financial resources. Verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though He was rich, yet for our sakes He became poor, that you through His poverty might become rich. Now, right in the middle of this section on giving, he drops in one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible, speaking of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Jesus, being rich in heaven, gave it up to become poor on this earth. Tells us in Philippians chapter 2 about Jesus that he, being in very nature God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation. In other words, he emptied himself of his privileges, the riches of the glories of heaven. He emptied himself of those things and took on the form of a servant and came in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient even to to death, even the death of the cross. You see this emptying of the Lord rich in heaven and yet becoming a poor man. Now, I have to say this, but you know, you you watch Christian television, you watch some of these televangelists. They get you to think that maybe Jesus was a rich person. You know, one once said that he wore designer clothes because he had a seamless tunic, you know, and so that gave him justification for his designer suits and his opulent lifestyle and Jesus was poor you remember when his parents took him to the temple when it was after the the time of purification after 40 days they went up to the temple and they offered there a pigeon and two turtle doves well that was in the law for an offering for very poor people otherwise they would give a lamb but they were poor. So they had to just go out and, and get a turtle dove or something. Maybe they caught it themselves and offer this thing. Jesus was a carpenter. He wasn't some wealthy high roller. He, he was an itinerant preacher in his earthly ministry. And he was supported by women. And they, they didn't have a lot of money. 
Even at his death, you remember that when he was crucified, they stripped him of that seamless tunic, and there they gambled for it. The one thing that he had of any value was stripped off his body and it was gambled away by the soldiers that crucified him. Jesus was poor. But here he says, Jesus became materially poor so that we could become spiritually rich. And spiritual riches are the true riches. These are the real riches that are going to last forever. It's not, it's not the pounds. It's not the investments. Those are not the true riches. The true riches are spiritual. Ephesians 1.3, Paul says, Blessed be God who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Those are the true riches. Every spiritual blessing. Those are the ones that are going to last forever. Jesus said it like this. What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world but forfeits his own soul? Who's the richest man in the world? It's probably Bill Gates or somebody like that, right? Now, I'm not judging Bill Gates' spirituality, but if you've got all of Bill Gates' money, but you're not a Christian, you've got nothing. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and becomes the richest person in the world but has not spiritual life? You've got nothing. The true riches are spiritual, and this is what Jesus came to do. He died for us. Got beneath us, became poor. He might lift us up to heaven so that we might have all those riches in heavenly places that are going to last forever. And the point that he's making by bringing this up is Jesus Christ was motivated by grace to give his whole life. He gave everything. He became poor so that others might be rich. And in this I give advice. It is to your advantage not only to be doing what you began and were desiring to do a year ago, but now you also must complete the the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to desire it, so there also may be a completion out of what you have. You said you were going to do it. Now is the time to do it. The time for talking is over. You know, there's a time to talk and then there's a time to act. Do you remember in Exodus chapter 14 when the children of Israel had come out of Egypt and they got up to the Red Sea and they were stuck there. They couldn't cross it. Couldn't go left, couldn't go right. And they looked behind and the Pharaoh and his army were bearing down and Moses began to freak out and cry. And God said this to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Not a time for crying. Not not even a time for praying. You need to do something. You need to move. You need to do it now. It's time for action, Moses. Joshua 7.10 After the sin of Achan, God said, they were kind of crying, Oh, why did this happen? We went to Ai and, you know, we got beaten badly by a small little village. How are we going to take Jericho? He said, or after after they had taken Jericho. He said, Get up! Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned. Why are you crying? You need to act now. And so there's a time to talk and then there's a time for action. For if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what one or what he does not have. It is accepted according to what one has and not according to what he does not have. God never asks you or me to give away anything that we don't have. But he asks us to be faithful for what we do have. And that's the way he always tests our sincerity. What are we doing now with what we have right now. Someone came to me recently and said, if I, had, if I won the lottery and got three million pounds, I'd give the first million of it to the church. 
And I said to him, well, why aren't you doing that now? And he, he kind of laughed and he said, oh, I haven't won the lottery yet. And I said, but are you giving a third of your income now? <laughs> and he only had like a, a coin in his hand and he was saying, you know, if I won the lottery. I said, well, are you giving a third of that right now? See, God always tests us on the small scale and then when we pass that test, He gives us more to be faithful with. Why would God give us more to be unfaithful with if we're not faithful with a smaller thing? He always tests our faithfulness on smaller responsibilities before giving us bigger ones. Jesus said it like this in Luke 16.10. If you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? There we go. And if you are not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus spoke a lot about money. And money, mammon, was a god. And he says, you can't serve these two masters. You can't serve God and money. You're going to have to make your choice. Are you serving money or are you serving God and using money? And the question is, what are you doing with what you've got right now? Not what you may have in the future. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack, that their abundance may also supply your lack, that there may be equality. As it is written, he who gathers much had nothing left over, he who gathered little had no lack. Okay, again, he's talking here about helping other Christians financially. Not the poor in society at this point. Of course, God cares about the poor in society. He wants us to help them. But here he's specifically talking about helping poor Christian brothers and sisters. Note something. This is not communism or socialism. Communism and socialism is thievery. It is taking money from people and it's taking it by force and giving it to somebody that it doesn't belong to. That's what that is. This is voluntary. It's from a heart of love and it affirms both private ownership and personal responsibility. That's the biblical way. So he's saying, in other words, you can help them now in their time of need and perhaps in the future when you're in need, they'll be able to help you and return the favor. But notice at the end, he says, as it is written, he who gathers much had nothing left over and he who gathered little had no lack. He's quoting the Old Testament when the children of Israel went out and gathered the manna. Now, when they gathered the manna, they were to gather it every day except the Sabbath day, but on the sixth day they were to gather twice as much and it would last on the seventh day. They weren't to gather it on the, on the seventh day. They were to rest. Well, when they would go out, they had to go get it. They weren't just to kind of kick back and open their mouths and manna would just fall into it. They had to get up and go out and pick up this manna. Now, some people who were weak, they could only gather a little bit. Other people who were stronger would gather more, but it didn't matter. When it came time to distribute the manna, everybody had enough. They all got an omer, which is about five pints of manna every single day. And if anyone tried to hoard manna, do you know what would happen to that manna? It would breed worms and stink. And so the manna would rot. And Paul is making a point here that if you're hoarding your money, 
your money becomes like hoarded manna and it will breed worms and stink. It just stinks to hoard your money when you could be distributing it and giving it away. When Lisa and I were dating, we uh, were in a, a small group fellowship. Um, we, we came from a very large church. I mean, this church is like one of those mega churches you see, 14,000 people. But there are lots of smaller groups, you know, like we meet here on Wednesday night, a smaller group. So we got involved with a small group, and the leader of that small group was a guy named Jack Bentham, married to Kelly. Jack was a Dutch guy who had moved to America. His dad was a farmer. And his dad had taught him some great lessons in the Christian life as he was growing up. And as, a, as farmers, they refused to work on the Lord's Day. And even though there were a, a couple of harvests where they could have gotten all the harvest in on the Sunday, uh, they didn't. And actually there was a storm and it ruined part of their harvest. But his dad taught him, look, we're going to put God first. And God always provided for them, always, when they put God first. Well, Jack, he was a clever guy. And he went to university, studied hard, ended up getting a job at the Los Alamos National Laboratory in Albuquerque. And they're the ones that make the nuclear weapons for the uh, U.S. military. And so, Jack, you know, I know he's on a good salary, he's making a lot of money. But when Lisa and I would go over and, and babysit their children, I noticed that they lived very humbly. I thought, that's odd. I know this guy's on a good salary, but he, he drives, you know, older cars, and he lives in just kind of a, a normal house, when he could live in something more opulent. Then I went into his kitchen, and I noticed something. On his refrigerator were magnets with all of these faces of children that they supported in third world countries. And I thought as a young Christian, wow, okay, here's this guy. He's using his money. He's storing up treasure in heaven. And it made a huge impact on my life. And then when God, we we got married and God called us to go on the mission field... They were, Jack and Kelly were some of the first ones who began to support us. And as we've looked back over the years of Christians who have supported us financially, their faithfulness all through the years has been amazing. A hundred dollars every month for 18 years. And I look at that and I think, man, what treasure they've got in heaven. What an amazing example to me. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, is your heart down here in the things of this world? Or is your heart up there in heaven? Are you storing up treasure there? Now I know that some of you maybe struggle with giving. I want to give you some practical tips on how you can be a better giver. Number one tip is this. To make a budget. It's very practical. Make a budget of your income and expenses. Find out how much you're bringing in and how much you're giving out. Take some time to do it right. You can go on um, Money Saving Expert. And you can get on there and you can find their budget planner. It's going to take you a few hours, but go through meticulously and figure out your budget. And once you do that, a few things are going to happen. You're going to see how you can live within your means. You're going to know how much you can give regularly to God's work. And you're going to know how to pray specifically for extra money in order to be a blessing to people all around you. And by the way, this is a great way to record God's answers to prayer. When you know how much you're bringing in, 
You know what the regular thing is, and then you're praying, oh God, I just want a little bit more so I can bless that person. And you get it? Mark that down in your prayer journal. God answered my prayer. And you'll build a great testimony. God may lead you to take steps of faith where you purchase something or you step out in faith in an area of ministry that you don't know where the money's going to come from. But God leads you to do it. He may do that. But you know what? God's never going to lead you into credit card debt or any personal debt. It's just not the way God does things. Because... Proverbs 22, 7 says, The borrower is a servant or a slave to the lender. And God doesn't want us to be a slave to anyone. Now, what about a mortgage? A mortgage is debt, but it's a wise investment, isn't it? It can be. If it's within your means to pay, because it is an appreciating asset, Whereas if you go into debt for something like a car or a television or something like that, that's a depreciating asset. That is not wise, a wise way to use your money. And so even you know, people go into debt for holidays. That, that's not wise to stick that on your credit card. If you're having trouble, by the way, with um, debt and you're upside down under in debt. Christians Against Poverty do a really good work. I was speaking with Peter. His parents now are, um, are involved with that here in, in Hastings, and we'll probably have something up on the notice board very soon how to get in touch with them. This is recommended by Martin Lewis of Money Saving Expert. They will help you with your debt, with a budget with getting a job. They even deal with gambling addictions and other type of addictions. And so, um, by the way, this is just an appeal. If anyone from the church would like to be involved with setting up a CAP center here, I think this would be tremendous. I I contacted them a year and a half ago and we were speaking on the phone and they asked if there's anyone here who would be willing to go up to Bradford and do the training and all that. And at the time, I just didn't have anyone that I thought could do it. But if there's anyone here who'd be interested in, in getting involved with that ministry, uh, let me know. And we could um, cover the cost of you going up there to be trained. Make a budget. That's number one. Number two, and there are only three. Um, give to God the first fruits of all your increase. Proverbs 3, verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. Then your barns will overflow. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. The first fruits are the first of your increase. The first of your wages. He says, honor the Lord with that. So as soon as you get it, you give to God. And again, God doesn't need it, but this is good for you. Because in the end, if you give to God last, He gets the leftovers. And you're, if you're like me, there's not much left over when I've done all the other things that I want to do. But when I get my priorities right, I put God first, God promises, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. You can take that to the bank. God will bless you and provide for you everything that you need. God will take care of it. So give to God first, the church, other gospel ministries. It doesn't matter how much you are making right now, even if you're on welfare. Start giving the first fruits and God will bless you. And then number three, pray about ways to express your love financially. God, I have this money. It's yours. My whole life is yours. I've given myself to you. How do you want me to use my money to bless someone else? And then when God shows you, do it. And so these are ways that we can practically 
give. 